We hear a great deal today about STEM education, meaning that many people feel we should be expanding instruction at all levels in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There's strong evidence that Americans are falling behind other countries in terms of what they know about science and mathematics, and in fact, we may be becoming illiterate in these areas. And that as that happens, America may be at risk for losing its technological competitive advantage. These are serious worries, and part of my interest in teaching great inventions has been to help you increase your own technological literacy. But what does technological literacy actually mean? Does it mean that you should be able to make a call on a cell phone? Or that you should be able to tell what happens inside that phone? Or that you can say something about the technical network, how the standards, the cells, and the microwave towers all fit together? Or that you can talk about how cell phones deliver individual convenience because users agree to cooperate with a large centralized bureaucracy. Now, while I can't help you necessarily with the first kind of technological literacy, I'm hopeless at using all the functions on my own cell phone. My daughters complain all the time that I'm always accidentally pocket dialing them. Nevertheless, I can help you in this lecture with the other four kinds of technological literacy. To do so, we'll look at two great inventions, communication satellites and cellular telephones, and see how they've been combined with digital information to make it possible by today to communicate with nearly every part of the planet. So let's talk first about satellites. Prior to satellites, international telephone service was provided by undersea cable or shortwave radio transmission, both of which were expensive and offered little bandwidth. And by bandwidth, I mean the capacity to carry multiple single signals simultaneously. Even into the 1950s, AT&T was worried that laying another undersea cable between the U.S. and Europe would only provide 36 additional telephone calls, and it might not be worth the heavy investment. During the 1960s, communication satellites changed all of this. Communication satellites provide television, telephone, and data services between two widely distant locations. They operate within a system in which signals are transmitted using microwaves from an Earth-based station up to the satellite, and that's known as the uplink. The satellite then amplifies the signals and retransmits them to a receiving station located at another point down on Earth, and that's called the downlink. Most communication satellites are in geostationary orbit at an altitude of about 22,000 miles. At that height, the satellite's period of rotation is the same as the Earth's period of rotation, so the satellite stays over the same spot on the globe. However, there are some satellites that operate in low Earth orbit. And those are typically about 250 miles above the Earth's surface, and they circle the planet every 90 minutes. Low Earth orbiting satellites are less expensive to launch into orbit than geostationary satellites, and due to the proximity to the ground, low Earth orbit satellites don't require as high a signal strength. And recall that the signal strength falls off as the square of the distance of the source, so when you're talking about satellites, this effect can be very dramatic. Because of their low altitude, these satellites are visible only from a portion of the Earth, and so as to perform tasks requiring uninterrupted connectivity, you need lots of satellites, known as a satellite constellation, orbiting all at the same time. A familiar example of a satellite constellation is the Global Positioning System that relies on 24 to 32 satellites. Now, to get real technical, Global Positioning uses satellites that are in medium orbits, not low Earth orbits. GPS has so many satellites, though, because one's position on Earth is reckoned by taking four signals from four different satellites. The idea of using satellites to relay radio signals around the world was first proposed by the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke in 1945. Clarke thought that satellites in geostationary orbit could be used to transmit messages from station to station and to hence expand radio broadcasting. As we all know, the space age began in 1957 when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, a base basketball-sized satellite that orbited the Earth for three months. Before Americans could even catch their breath, the Soviets launched a second satellite, Sputnik 2, which carried a dog named Laika into space and which the American press renamed Mutnik. The United States responded by launching several of its own satellites, including Echo-1. Designed by Bell Labs, Echo-1 consisted of a large Mylar balloon coated with a thin layer of aluminum so that radio signals bounced off its surface. 
ECHO was a passive satellite, meaning that it did not possess any onboard electronics. For Bell Lab engineers, this was satisfactory as they wanted to make sure they understood how to develop the stations needed on Earth to provide the uplink and the downlink. Once they acquired this knowledge, Bell engineers went on to design Telstar, the first satellite that could receive and retransmit television and telephone signals, and Telstar was launched in 1962. Telstar combined a number of technologies previously developed at, trans at Bell Labs, including transistorized circuits and photovoltaic panels that provided power for the satellite. Telstar was succeeded by several generations of satellites launched by the International Telecommunications Satellite Organization, quite a large name, and so it's often called Intelsat. Well, Intelsat 1, launched in 1965, could handle 2,400 voice channels. It's Intelsat's ninth generation satellites, which were launched in the early 2000s, carried 600,000 telephone calls or 600 television channels. By the 1990s, Intelsat was operating 15 satellites, which could beam television programs and provide telephone service anywhere in the world. In 1970, the Soviets launched their first communication satellite, Molnaya. And since then, other station nations have launched their own satellites into orbit, including Canada, Indonesia, China, Japan, the European Union, France, the Arab League, Australia, Mexico, and Britain. By the end of the 1970s, satellites were transmitting television programs to all parts of the globe, and they were carrying over two-thirds of all telephone calls. Beginning in the 1980s, however, the introduction of high-capacity fiber optic cable has meant that undersea lines are once again proving and providing more telephone service. Today, there are thousands of satellites circling the Earth used not only for communications, but also for weather, Earth imaging, military communications, and as I said a moment ago, global positioning. There are in fact enough dead satellites up there now that engineers need to worry about as new satellites are launched, making sure that the new satellites don't crash into the space junk. Let's turn now to talk about cell phones. Along with satellites, global communications have been greatly affected by the development of cellular telephones. Cellular telephones use microwaves to communicate with a base station that in turn routes the calls from the sender to the recipient. As we saw in Lecture 27, while Marconi and his companies concentrated on sending Morse code messages, his rival, Reginald Fessenden, experimented as early as 1906 with transmitting speech via radio waves. During the 1920s, RCA provided a variety of radio telephone services, and by 1930, telephone customers in the United States could be connected by radio to a passenger on an ocean liner in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. During World War II, the Army contracted with the Galvin Manufacturing Company of Chicago, soon to become Motorola, to manufacture radio telephones for use by troops in the field. Motorola produced two models, a walkie-talkie, which consisted of a radio and a backpack, and a handy-talkie that could be held in one hand. Both of these devices relied on vacuum tube technology and high voltage dry cells. After the war, AT&T was looking for new markets and it introduced mobile telephone service for use in automobiles. Beginning with the service in 1946 in St. Louis, AT&T expanded its mobile telephone service eventually to 100 towns and highway corridors, and they did so by 1948. Mobile telephone service was a rarity with only about 5,000 customers placing perhaps 30,000 calls each week. The required equipment required about 80 pounds and took up a fair amount of trunk space. Now subscriber growth was limited by the technology because there were only three radio channels that were available, only three customers in any given city could make a mobile call at the same time. Even though AT&T's mobile telephone service was the only service available until the 1970s, engineers at Bell Labs were quick to recognize the limitations of the system. As early as 1947, they proposed laying out a network of hexagonal cells for mobile phones in vehicles. Rather than have the cell towers at the center of each cell, another Bell Labs researcher suggested that the towers be at the corners of the hexagons and that the towers have directional antennas that would transmit and receive in three directions in three different hexagonal cells at the same time. As promising as these ideas were, though, 
AT&T could neither secure the radio frequencies needed from the Federal Communications Commission, nor could it develop the electronics needed to manage the switching system. In the mid-1950s, AT&T hoped that the FCC would allow them to use ultra-high frequency, UHF, which is a portion of the radio spectrum for mobile telephony. But the Commission chose to award UHF to television stations, hoping that it would stimulate the proliferation of local channels that could compete with the three dominant networks that were on the VHF channels. However, the UHF stations did not appear to absorb all of the bandwidth, and so in the 60s, the FCC let it be known that it would entertain new proposals for creating mobile telephony. Both AT&T and Motorola submitted plans to the FCC in 1971 to enter this business. Because Motorola was worried that it would lose a significant portion of the two-way car radio business that it had built up, Motorola suggested that if AT&T got in the business, it would crush the competition and create a monopoly. As a concession to these fears put, out, put forward by Motorola, AT&T agreed to concentrate on building and running the cellular network and not get into the business of manufacturing handsets. As a result, Motorola was left in a position where it could concentrate on the handset business. Once the regulatory hurdles had been cleared, Richard H. Frankel and Joel Engel, both at Bell Labs, turned to developing the electronics needed for the system. In doing so, they were helped by the significant fact that microprocessors, chips, were becoming more and more powerful and were dropping in price. Microprocessors are essential for cell phone technology because so much of the running of the system is information processing. For a caller to reach somebody in the network, Computers are needed not only in the central office, at, but also at each cell tower and in each phone. And all of those microprocessors are needed in order to locate and track the user wherever they are in the honeycomb cellular network, and they're needed to monitor the, the signal strength of the call. As Frankel pointed out, cellular is a computer technology. It's not a radio technology. The electronics also had to overcome another challenge. Namely, that with the existing system, a car with a mobile phone had to stay within the coverage area serviced by one base station during the duration of the entire call. In other words, there was no way to hand off the call as the car moved from one cell into another. In response, Amos Joel at Bell Labs perfected an automatic call handoff system that allowed mobile phones to move through several cell centers during a single conversation without an eruption. But while engineers could now come up, had now come up with a way that mobile phones could roam, they still hadn't solved the problem of how to increase the number of users, and that more users were going to be needed if it was going to become economically feasible to build a regional or national cell phone network. After all, who was going to pay for all those cell towers and all the computers needed to process the calls? How could a cell phone network ever have the millions of users needed to offset the tens of millions of dollars that it would cost to build the network. How could they, and how could they all communicate at the same time? The answer was to rethink how a cell phone network might allocate bandwidth. Since there isn't enough space on the radio spectrum for each cell phone to have its, its own frequency, engineers decided that they would reuse frequencies. Rather than assigning a single frequency to each phone, the engineers would assign a group of frequencies that then would be used by the entire system. When a call is placed, the phone system picks an open frequency for that call and makes the connection. With the cellular system, frequency reuse made a great deal of sense since for any given call, the system could assign, could assign it not only the frequencies available in one cell, but also hand the call off to other open frequencies as the caller moved from cell to cell. Consequently, when one makes a call on a cell phone while driving in a car, the call, the call can use several frequencies with several handoffs occurring every time the car moves between cells. Remarkably, computers monitor the cell strength of the call every few seconds, looking to see if it would be better for the call to switch to a different frequency. And the computers, as a result, came to handle these changes so smoothly that most of us sel seldom notice that these frequency switches are ever happening. In researching these problems, AT&T spent on the order of $100 million to perfect cell phone technology. 
Now, all that remained was to create a portable phone that could operate outside of an automobile. Both Motorola and Bell raced to be the first to produce a handheld mobile phone. Drawing on its experiences with walkie-talkies and pagers, Motorola won that race, and on April 1973, Martin Cooper, a Motorola researcher, used the first portable cell phone to call his counterpart, Joel Engel, at Bell Labs. The first handheld phone used by Dr. Cooper weighed 2.5 pounds, and it measured 9 inches by 5 inches by 1.75 inches, and that's a real brick. It offered a talk time of just 30 minutes, and it took 10 hours to recharge. The first cellular telephone network was established in Japan in 1979, and a second early system was deployed in Scandinavia, in Denmark, Finland, Sweden, and Norway in 1981. These Scandinavian countries, and particularly Finland, have a low population density. That means there's lots of people in a few cities like Helsinki, but few people that live in the northern parts like the Lapland regions. And the government there saw cell phones as a way to connect the Finnish people together. Equally, the Japanese and Scandinavian governments could invest in this technology early on because unlike the U.S., the telecommunications in those countries is state-controlled. The first network in the U.S. was set up by AT&T and Motorola in 1983 to serve the Chicago area. This network grew from 200,000 subscribers in the first year to 2 million users five years later. The first cell networks relied on analog signal processing using separate frequencies or channels for each conversation. They therefore required considerable bandwidth for a large number of users. These systems were also unencrypted, meaning that not only could people eavesdrop on cell phone calls using a police scanner, but they could also hack into the system and make free calls, and that was a practice that's known as cloning. In response, telecommunications engineers developed a second generation, 2G, a new protocol that utilized digital signal processing. After using several different techniques, American cell phone networks settled on a combination of digital voice compression and digital modulation, a technique known in the industry as co-division multiple access, or CDMA. By increasing the capacity of the existing cell phone network 10 to 20 times, and hence reducing the cost of individual calls, CDMA has had an important impact on the development of the cell industry. Other multiplexing techniques were developed in other countries, including the Digital Global System for Mobile Communications, which is known as GSM, and that was introduced in 1988 by the European community. Since then, most of the world has adopted GSM, but the U.S. has continued to use CDMA, with the result that American cell phones are not able to connect with foreign networks. By 2005, GSM networks accounted for more than 75% of the worldwide cellular market, and they were serving 1.5 billion subscribers. With 2G came new features like text messaging, which was first introduced in the United Kingdom in 1992, as well as SIM cards, which could be used to transfer the identity of a user and his or her account from one phone to another. Coinciding with the introduction of 2G systems was the trend away from those large brick phones that I mentioned a moment ago towards smaller phones weighing only a few ounces. These new phones took advantage of both advanced lithium-ion batteries and more efficient electronics. However, they were also feasible because of the increasing density of the cellular network meant that the average distance for transmission from phone to base was getting shorter, leading to have to use less battery power to transmit up to the base station. As 2G phones became more commonplace, cell phone manufacturers began to explore how they could provide not only telephone but data services as well. This was desirable for cell phone companies because it would attract more customers as well as to allow the companies to more efficiently use the networks they had built. In particular, the companies realized that people could get their email delivered to their phones, but to do so would require greater data speeds than, were, than could be provided by the existing 2G service. In response, the industry developed the next generation of technology known as 3G. The main difference between 2G and 3G is that 3G use, uses packet switching for data transmission. And that's something that we'll discuss in Lecture 34 on the Internet. 
As this technology was launched first in Japan and Europe in 2001, and the following year in 2002. And by the end of 2007, there were 295 million 3G subscribers worldwide, which reflected about 9% of the subscriber base. While 3G networks offered the possibility of streaming videos such as TV shows or YouTube videos, telecommunication companies have assumed that the market will only grow by increasing data transmission speeds. Hence, starting in 2006, the industry began developing optimized fourth generation technologies with the promise of speed improvements up to tenfold over the existing 3G technologies. Just as American automobile manufacturers in the 1930s discovered that it was cheaper to add accessories like radios, white wall tires, or different interiors, and that was cheaper to do that than to modify the basic design of the cars, so cell manufacturers began to notice the same. While phone service companies have concentrated on increasing data transmission speeds, the manufacturers of phones have focused their efforts on adding features such as cameras, GPS units, clocks, and scheduling tools. Such features are possible as computer chips have become more powerful and cheaper, a topic that we took up in Lecture 30. The most recent entry in the accessory race for are smartphones. Generally speaking, smartphones, which include iPhones, Blackberries, and Android devices, are those phones on which users can download special applications. As it did with personal computers, Apple has been reluctant to openly share the details of the operating system for its iPhones with any and all developers, leading to a practice of jailbreaking, whereby hackers try to figure out how to crack the security codes and introduce their own non-authorized apps onto, onto iPhones. According to a 2012 survey, about half the U.S. mobile consumers own smartphones now and could account for around 70% of all cell phone mobile devices by 2013. While cell phones are seen as a convenience in affluent industrial countries, this technology has had significant social impacts in other societies. In Finland, the government recognized in the 1980s that cell phones could be used to increase social ties in a population that, as we said, was widely dispersed across the countryside. As a result, for many years, the Finnish people have had the highest number of cell phones per capita in the world, and the Finnish cell phone company Nokia is regarded as a major player in this global industry. Similarly, many African nations see cell phones as a major way to connect people in small rural villages with the rest of society without having to build expensive landlines for telephones. Cell phones have proven to be enormously popular in Africa, and the number of cell phones connected between 1997 and 2002 was greater than all traditional phones that have been placed in service on the continent in the previous century. Africa now has about one billion people, but in 2012 there were an estimated 700 million SIM cards in use. This means that while not everyone has a phone, a huge number of people have accounts represented by the SIM cards and they simply borrow a phone when they need one. As cell phone networks have grown in Africa, both entrepreneurs and consumers have come up with many remarkable ways to use their phones. For example, Africa's farmers use cell phones to share weather information, market prices, and microinsurance schemes. Farmers are now able to send a text message to find out the crop prices in places thousands of miles away, and then they are able to decide whether they should send their crops there in order to get the best possible price. Many Africans now use mobile phones to pay their bills and airtime, to buy goods and make payments to individuals. Indeed, remittances from relatives living abroad are often received via mobile banking. Within refugee camps, mobile phones are, are essential for finding displaced persons and allowing those persons to reconnect with family and loved ones. And mobile phones are used to provide entertainment. Africa now teams with online platforms like Kula Happy, a popular online Kenyan entertainment channel that works especially on a small mobile screen, or Afrinali, which bills itself as African movies in your pocket. Equally, cell phones have in other countries come to play an important part in bringing about political change. In 2001, for instance, protesters in the Philippines used text messaging and cell phones 
to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people to oppose the newly reelected President Joseph Estrada. A huge crowd gathered at the EDSA shrine in central Manila, and in response to that huge crowd, Estrada resigned and Gloria Arroyo was sworn in in front of the crowd at the EDSA. As I said in the beginning, it's important that we all develop our sense of technological literacy. For me, that means that we know how to use a cell phone, but that's not enough. Technological literacy should embrace not so much about understanding how the electrons whiz about in the circuits inside the phone, that's the physics, but more importantly, that we come to know how the calls actually get made using the hexagonal cell structure, microwave towers, and frequency reusing. It also helps to know how the state regulates and promotes technologies like cell phones, and we've seen how the FCC opened the way to cell phone innovation in 1971 by taking proposals from AT&T and Motorola. And we've also seen how Finland has invested in this technology in order to develop a stronger society. And you should be aware of the business strategy of cell phone providers and cell phone manufacturers, how they make their money, and how that informs what they're trying to sell you. Knowing a little bit about all of these things may be a tall order, but this is the literacy that citizens are going to need to make decisions in the future about this and the great inventions that are coming ahead.